himself. Mighty were the words which again and again he impressed upon his followers. Until now you have seen those who led you, but there are higher leaders whom you do not see. It is these leaders to whom you are subject. You shall carry out the orders of the God whom you do not see, and you shall obey one of whom you can make no image to yourself. Thus did the new and highest commandment come from the mouth of the great leader, prescribing the veneration of a God whom no sensory visible image could resemble, and therefore of whom none was to be made. Of this great fundamental commandment of the fifth human root race, the well-known commandment which follows is an echo, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Exodus 20, 1 The principal leader, Manu, was assisted by other divine messengers who executed his intentions for particular branches of life and worked on the development of the new race. For it was a matter of arranging all of life according to the new conception of a divine administration of the world. Everywhere the thoughts of men were to be directed from the visible to the invisible. Life is determined by the forces of nature. The course of human life depends on day and night, on winter and summer, on sunshine and rain. How these influential visible events are connected with the invisible, divine powers and how man is to behave in order to arrange his life in accordance with these invisible powers was shown to him. All knowledge and all labor was to be pursued in this sense. In the course of the stars and of the weather, man was to see divine decrees, the emanation of divine wisdom. Astronomy and meteorology were taught with this idea. Man was to arrange his labor, his moral life in such a way that they would correspond to the wise laws of the divine. Life was ordered according to divine commandments, just as the divine thoughts were explored in the course of the stars and in the changes of the weather. Man was to bring his works into harmony with the dispensations of the gods through sacrificial acts. It was the intention of Manu to direct everything in human life toward the higher world. All human activity, all institutions were to bear a religious character. Through this, Manu wanted to initiate the real task imposed upon the fifth root race. This race was to learn to direct itself by its own thoughts. But such a self-determination can only lead to good if man also places himself at the service of the higher powers. Man should use his faculty of thought, but this faculty of thought should be sanctified by being devoted to the divine. One can only understand completely what happened at that time if one knows that the development of the faculty of thought, beginning with the fifth subrace of the Atlanteans, also entails something else. From a certain quarter men had come into possession of knowledge and of arts, which were not immediately connected with what the above mentioned Manu had to consider as his true task. This knowledge and these arts were at first devoid of religious character. They came to man in such a way that he could think of nothing other than to place them at the service of self-interest, of his personal needs asterisk. To such knowledge belongs, for example, that of the use of fire in human activity. In the first Atlantean time man did not use fire since the life force was available for his service. But with the passage of time he was less and less in a position to make use of this force, hence he had to learn to make tools, utensils from so-called lifeless objects. 
be employed fire for this purpose. Similar conditions prevailed with respect to other natural forces. Thus man learned to make use of such natural forces without being conscious of their divine origin. So it was meant to be. Man was not to be forced by anything to relate these things which served his faculty of thought to the divine order of the world. Rather was he to do this voluntarily in his thoughts. It was the intention of Manu to bring men to the point where, independently, out of an inner need, they brought such things into a relation with the higher order of the world. Men could choose whether they wanted to use the insight they had attained purely in a spirit of personal self-interest or in the religious service of a higher world. If man was previously forced to consider himself as a link in the divine government of the world, by which, for example, the domination over the life force was given to him without his having to use the faculty of thought, he could now employ the natural forces without directing his thoughts to the divine. Not all men whom Manu had gathered around him were equal to this decision, but only a few of them. It was from this view that Manu could really form the germ of the new race. He retired with them in order to develop them further, while the others mingled with the rest of mankind. From this small number of men who finally gathered around Manu, Sanctified by their power, 
surrounded by the splendor which this power conferred upon them. From an external point of view, the human initiates of later times are men among men. But they remain in relation with the higher world, and the revelations and manifestations of the divine messengers come to them. Only exceptionally, when a higher necessity arises, do they make use of certain powers which are conferred upon them from above. Then they accomplish these which men cannot explain by the laws they know and which therefore they rightly regard as miracles. But in all this the higher intention is to put mankind on its own feet, fully to develop its faculty of thought. Today the human initiates are the mediators between the people and the higher powers, and only initiation can make one capable of communication with the divine messenger. The human initiates, the sacred teachers, became leaders of the rest of mankind in the beginning of the fifth root race. The great priest kings of prehistory who are not spoken of in history, but rather in the world of legend, belong among these initiates. The higher divine messengers retired from the earth more and more, and left the leadership to these human initiates, whom however they assisted in word and deed. Were this not so, man would never attain free use of his faculty of thought. The world is under divine direction, but man is not to be forced to admit this. He is to realize and to understand it by free reflection. When he reaches this point, the initiates will gradually divulge their secrets to him. But this cannot happen all at once. The whole development of the fifth root race is a slow road to this goal. At first Manu himself led his following like children. Then the leadership was gradually transferred to the human initiate. Today progress still consists in a mixture of the conscious and unconscious acting and thinking of men. Only at the end of the fifth root race, when throughout the sixth and seventh sub-races a sufficiently great number of men are capable of knowledge, will the greatest among the initiates be able to reveal himself to them openly. Then this human initiate will be able to assume the principal leadership just as Manu did at the end of the fourth group race. Thus the education of the fifth group race consists in this, that a greater part of humanity will become able freely to follow a human Manu as the germinal race of this fifth root race follows the Divine One. Dash dash dash. Asterisk, for the present it is not permitted to make public communications about the origin of this knowledge in these arts. A passage from the Akasha Chronicle must therefore be omitted here. Dash dash dash. By the Lemurian race. A passage from the Akasha Chronicle referring to a very distant prehistoric period in the development of mankind will be set forth in this chapter. This period precedes the one depicted in the descriptions given above. We are here concerned with the third human root race, of which it is said in theosophical books that it inhabited the Lemurian continent. According to these books, this continent was situated south of Asia, and extended approximately from Ceylon to Madagascar. What is today southern Asia and parts of Africa also belong to it. While all possible care has been taken in the deciphering of the Akasha Chronicle, it must be emphasized that nowhere is a dogmatic character to be claimed for these communications if, to begin with, the reading of things and events so remote from the present is not easy. The translation of what has been seen and deciphered into the language of today presents almost insuperable obstacles. Dates will be given later.
they will be better understood when the whole Lemurian period and also the period of our fifth Riz race up to the present have been discussed. The things which are communicated here are surprising even for the occultists to read them for the first time, although the word, surprising, is not quite exact. Therefore, you should only communicate them after the most careful examination. The fourth, the Atlantean Milk Race, was preceded by the so-called Lemurian. During its development, events of the very greatest importance occurred with respect to the Earth and to man. Here, however, something will first be said of the character of this Milk Race after these events and only then will the latter be discussed. By and large, memory was not yet developed among this race. While men could have ideas of things and events, these ideas did not remain in the memory. Therefore they did not yet have a language in the true sense. Rather what they could utter were natural sounds which expressed their sensations, pleasure, joy, pain and so forth, but which did not designate external objects. But their ideas had a quite different strength from those of later men. Through this strength they acted upon their environment. Other men, animals, plants, and even lifeless objects could feel this action and could be influenced purely by ideas. Thus the Lemurian could communicate with his fellow men without needing a language. This communication consisted in a kind of thought reading. The Lemurian derived the strength of his ideas directly from the objects which surrounded him. It flowed to him from the energy of growth of plants, from the life force of animals. In this manner he understood plants and animals in their interaction and life. He even understood the physical and chemical forces of life as objects in the same way. When he built something he did not first have to calculate the load limit of a tree trunk, the weight of a stone, he could see how much the tree trunk could bear where the stone in view of its weight and height would fit, where it would not. Thus the Lemurian built without engineering knowledge on the basis of his faculty of imagination which acted with the sureness of a kind of instinct. Moreover, to a great extent, he had power over his own body. When it was necessary, he could increase the strength of his arm by a simple effort of the will. For example, he could lift enormous loads merely by using his will. If later the Atlantean was helped by his control of the life force, the Lemurian was helped by his mastery of the will. He was, the expression could not be misinterpreted a born magician in all fields of lower human activity. The goal of the Lemurians was the development of the will of the faculty of imagination. The education of children was wholly directed toward this. The boys were hardened in the strongest manner. They had to learn to undergo danger, to overcome pain, to accomplish daring deeds. Those who could not bear tortures, who could not undergo dangers, were not regarded as useful members of mankind. They were left to perish under these exertions. What the Akasha Chronicle shows with respect to this raising of children surpasses everything contemporary man can picture to himself in his boldest imagining. The bearing of heat, even of a searing fire, the piercing of the body with pointed objects were quite common procedures. The raising of girls was different. While the female child was also hardened, everything else was directed toward her developing a strong imagination. For example, 
she was exposed to the storm in order calmly to feel its dreadful beauty. She had to witness the combats of the men fearlessly, filled only with a feeling of appreciation of the strength and power she saw before her. Thereby propensities for dreaming and for fantasy developed in the girl, and these were highly valued. Because no memory existed, these propensities did not degenerate. The dream or fantasy conceptions in question lasted only as long as there was a corresponding external cause. Thus they had a real basis in external things. They did not lose themselves in bottomless depths. It was, so to speak, nature's own fantasy and dreaming which were put into the female soul. The Lemurians did not have dwellings in our sense except in their latest time. They lived where nature gave them the opportunity to do so. The caves which they used were only altered and extended in so far as necessary. Later they built such caves themselves and at that time they developed great skill for such construction. One must not imagine, however, that they did not also execute more artful construction. But these did not serve as dwelling. In the earliest times they originated in the desire to give to the things of nature a man-made form. Hills were remodeled in such a way that the form afforded man joy and pleasure. Stones were put together for the same purpose, or in order to be used for certain activities. The places where the children were hardened were surrounded with walls of this kind. Toward the end of this period, the buildings which served for the cultivation of divine wisdom and divine art became more and more imposing and ornate. These institutions differed in every respect from what temples were later, for they were educational and scientific institutions at the same time. He who was found fit was here initiated into the science of the universal laws and into the handling of them. If the Lemurian was a born magician, this talent was here developed into art and insight. Only those could be admitted who, through all kinds of discipline, had acquired the ability to overcome themselves to the greatest extent. For all others what went on in these institutions was the deepest secret. Here one learned to know and to control the forces of nature through direct contemplation of them. But the learning was such that in man the forces of nature changed into forces of the will. He himself could thereby execute what nature accomplished. What later mankind accomplished by reflection, by calculation, at that time had the character of an instinctive activity. But here one must not use the word, instinct, in the same sense in which one is accustomed to apply it to the animal world. For the activities of Lemurian humanity towered high above everything the animal world can produce through instinct. They even stood far above what mankind has since acquired in the way of arts and sciences through memory, reason and imagination. If one were to use an expression for these institutions which would facilitate an understanding of them, one could call them colleges of the power and of the clairvoyant power of the imagination. From them emerged the men who, in every respect, became rulers of the others. Today it is difficult to give in words a true conception of all these conditions. For everything on earth has changed since that time. Nature itself and all human life were different. Therefore human labor and the relationship of man to man differed greatly from what is customary today. The air was much thicker even than in later Atlantean times, the water much thinner. And what forms the firm crust of our Earth today was not yet as hard as it later became. 
the world as plants and animals had developed only as far as the amphibians, the birds, and the lower mammals, and as far as vegetable growth which resemble our palms and similar trees. However, all forms were different from what they are today. But now exists only all in forms which then developed to gigantic sizes. At that time our small ferns were trees and formed mighty forests. The modern higher mammals did not exist. On the other hand a great part of humanity was on such a low stage of development that one cannot be designated as animal. What has been described here was true only of a small part of mankind. The rest lived their life in animalism. In their external appearance and in their way of life, these animal men were quite different from the small group. They were not especially different from the lower mammals, which resembled them in form in certain respects. A few more words must be said about the significance of the above-mentioned temple locality. What was cultivated here was not really religion. It was divine wisdom and art. Man felt that what was given to him there was a direct gift from the spiritual universal forces. When he received this gift he considered himself a servant of these universal forces. He felt himself sanctified from everything unspiritual. If one wishes to speak of religion at this stage of the development of mankind, one could call it religion of the will. The religious temper and dedication lay in the fact that man guarded the powers granted to him as a strict, divine, secret, and that he led a life through which he sanctified his power. Persons who had such powers were regarded by others with great awe and veneration. And this awe and veneration were not called forth by laws or something similar, but by the immediate power which these persons exercised. The uninitiated of course stood under the magical influence of the initiated. It was also natural that the latter considered themselves to be sanctified personages. For in their temples they participated in direct contemplation of the active forces of nature. They looked into the creative workshop of nature. They experienced the communion with the being which filled the world itself. One can call this communication an association with the gods. What later developed as initiation as mystery emerged from this original manner of communication of men with the gods. In subsequent times this communication had to become different, since the human imagination, the human spirit, took other forms. A special importance is something which occurred in the course of Lemurian development by virtue of the fact that the women lived in the manner described above. They thereby developed special human powers. of the forces of nature. 
resided in the female element are developed in action through the soul, through the inner, personal forces of man. The development of mankind can only be correctly understood by the one who takes into consideration that the first progress in the life of the imagination was made by women. The development connected with the life of the imagination, with the formation of memory, of customs which formed the seeds for a life of law, for a kind of morals, came from this side. If man had seen and exercised the forces of nature, woman became the first interpreter of them. It was a special new manner of living through reflection which developed here. This manner had something much more personal than that of the man. One must imagine this manner of the women to have been also a kind of clairvoyant, although it differed from the magic of the will of the man. In her soul woman was accessible to another kind of spiritual power. The latter spoke more to the feeling element of the soul, less to the spiritual, to which man was subject. Thus there emanated from men an effect which was more natural divine, from women one which was more soul divine. The development which women went through during the Lemurian period had the result that of the appearance of the next, the Atlantean, new race on Earth, an important role evolved upon her. This appearance took place under the influence of highly developed entities who were familiar with the laws of the formation of races and capable of guiding the existing forces of human nature into such paths that